Yeah, hello everybody. Thanks for coming. Yeah, welcome to this uh, Ethereum JS workshop. Uh, I am Gabriel from the Ethereum JS team. My name is Scotty, also from the Ethereum JS team. Yeah. So today we're just going to be walking you through our model repo called, you know, the Ethereum JS model repo. So we're basically the JavaScript team of the Ethereum Foundation, and what we do with the uh, Ethereum JS and Mono Repo. Let me actually bring up the slides. It's going to be helpful. So yeah, what we do with Ethereum JS is we basically build uh, a set of tools that people can build upon. So we're used by lots of uh, you know JavaScript tooling that you, I'm sure you're familiar with, and. Um, yeah, and it's really a great uh, set of tools for people to learn uh, about blockchain in general because JavaScript is a you know really easy to use language that a lot of people, a lot of web developers are familiar with, and um, yeah, we're focused on you know helping out a lot with research as well. I mean, we have a, for example a client going, but it's not a production ready client like like Get and, and others, and that's kind of an advantage for us because we can jump in early for you know newer EIPs and implement stuff because we're not constrained by the, the maintenance of like a production ready client for example so yeah we've been helping out with lots of you know newer EIPs so yeah that's just you know an example of that so yeah three of the latest like PRs that are in progress in the Mono repo are you know, a stateless Virgil state manager to help out with Virgil trees that Guillaume and a bunch of other people are working with. Uh, AIP 4844, which I'm sure you've heard about, like proto then sharding EIP. And uh, yeah, beacon chain withdrawals, which are going to be uh, part of uh, the Shanghai uh, hard fork. Hard fork. Uh, hopefully, I think the community would be pretty mad if that doesn't get in. So, yeah, you want to. Uh, sure. I'd, I'd also like to just say hello and maybe get a sense of who's with us today. Um, if people used our mono repo yet, are you DAP developers? Um, just get like a sample from the crowd of like who, what, what brings you guys to this workshop? Anybody? So <laughs> raise your hand if you've already interacted with the Ethereum JS mono repo. Okay. So this is relatively new to most of you. Awesome, awesome. Um, and that's good. It's um, part of our focus is having these tools available in a language that devs know and are building in. And you know, as you're as you're learning more about Ethereum and about how all this works, uh, hopefully our library can help you get there. Um, So yeah, I've been with the team since the beginning of the year. Gabriel's been here a little bit longer. Um, and yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so we, so I'm gonna go through that slide quickly just to give you a sense of the, the kinds of like packages that we have. So we have an implementation in TypeScript. I mean, we're calling it JavaScript, but technically right at the moment, everything is TypeScript. We've migrated to TypeScript about two years ago. Uh, so we have a TypeScript implementation of the Ethereum virtual machine. Uh, we also provide, you know, building blocks like transaction block, blockchain. We also had to have a bunch of like smaller scope like utils. Like for example, if you want a RLP, uh, like recursive land prefixing, like encode things, decode things. Uh, we have a TypeScript implementation of a uh, Merkle Petrucci tree as well, which is, you know, the data structure that Ethereum uses. Uh, we have a dev P2B package and an experimental client. Uh, it has sync magnet. There's been a guy who was, was able to sync magnet up to the tip of the chain. It's not really performant. So, I mean, you wouldn't want to use it in production and we don't have like the mitigation that are in place for more like production ready clients, but it, it is able to run all, all blocks from mainnet. So, yeah, I was just mentioning it's used by a bunch of tooling. So. All these are some of the you know packages that I'm sure you're familiar with, like Hardhat, Truffle, MetaMask, Remix, 
uh, Web3.js and a bunch of other, you know, projects uh, use us as a dependency for to to build upon. So yeah, let us give you uh, an overview of how the um, Ethereum uh, JS packages kind of work together, right? So at the very bottom, we have the client. Now the arrows pointing to the client mean that the client is importing, you know, the packages, uh, all these other, you know, packages. So at the very bottom, we have client, which imports basically everything that we've built in the model repo, whereas common is just going to be more uh, like general things that you probably wouldn't use uh, by themselves, but are going to be helpful for, uh, like, for example, in common, you would have like uh, specifications for hard forks and stuff like that, which if you want to, you know, build a block, you know, you need to know like which hard fork you're building, you know, a block for. Same thing with a transaction, same thing if you want to run a block in the EVM and stuff like that. So that all lives in common. We've tried to modulize it in a way that's more, that makes more sense and that makes it easy to, um, to import and export things without them being all intertwined. So, yeah, you might have heard like the term VM, EVM, EEI. Uh, we also have, you know, a state manager. So basically, uh, VM is like a higher level, like virtual machines, virtual machine, which uh, sends, you, know, you would provide that like a block. You would tell the VM, hey, uh, I want you to run a block or I want you to run a transaction that it would forward uh, an individual like message calls to the EVM, which would deal with like the opcodes and all that sort of stuff. Then the EVM would report back and communicate with a state manager that's going to update like whatever state you have uh, in your Merkle Patricia tree. So it's much easier to interact with the state manager because then you can just, for example, update an account's balance rather than like finding the proper key in the Merkle Patricia tree, updating that and recomputing the root, which would be, you know, super tedious, obviously. So we've abstracted most of that away with the, the state manager. Yeah, I'll leave you to Scotty to talk about the portal network, which is another thing that we are working on. Right, portal network, um, it's actually a series of, of networks that are peer-to-peer -peer networks, special storage networks, and this is, all in under construction and under design at the moment, but we are implementing portal network clients in TypeScript using Ethereum JS libraries. Um, there are two other teams working in Rust and NIM at the same time to implement this. Um, so essentially, if you if you want to interact with the blockchain right now. You either need to run your own full node, which is a very heavy process requiring a lot of your resources, um, and most most people aren't going to do that, and most devices aren't going to want to do that. Um, so most reach out to Infura, which is a centralized access to the blockchain, which works fine, but it is a centralized access to the blockchain, which is kind of the thing we're trying to avoid. So. It, People have been working for many years trying to figure out what goes up in that top left box where we can have something lightweight, accessible, but also decentralized. And the work on LES light clients has eventually led us to this concept called the portal, portal network. Um, portal network is, it's an, in, it's an independent peer-to-peer -peer network. It's almost like a, a BitTorrent. It's working on that principle where um, if you need access to some amount of information from the blockchain, you don't need to actually sync to the entire blockchain to retrieve your, you know, your block history or your account history or many of the things that human-driven wallet interactions um, need. Uh, so that's the idea. We, we're building networks to support the users of this protocol, not necessarily building up the protocol itself the way a real full node does. And therefore, this can exist on very light resource constrained devices. You could build it into the back end of a wallet app and it can just be running in the background of your phone or your watch or your anything. And um, 
essentially the more the more devices hooked into these networks, the better they will work. And part of that is that you don't have to sync to the entire blockchain because that takes a long time and doesn't really make sense for a small app or a small device to want to do that. It takes a long time, it's very heavy, and doesn't really get you where you wanted to go. So with the portal network, you could just reach out, get the tip of the chain, get your account balance and all these things and be immediately, immediately serve your purpose. Um, just kind of explaining the same thing. With Infura, everyone's reaching out to the same thing. With the LES, you get this kind of pile up where the more nodes involved in the system, the more clunky it works and the harder it is to actually return anything, but a distributed system, every, everybody's got a piece, a little piece of responsibility of the network and they hold as much data as they're willing to and they serve as much as they can or want to. Um, so for a practical example, in a, you know, just a, a JSON RPC call for ETH get balance, um, Right now, if you're running a node, you have to maintain all of these databases where you can look up the, the canonical index, you can look up storage, you can look up state and return these things, calculate them, and then return the balance. Portal Network's gonna work exactly the same, but instead of looking into your own databases, your own huge piles of state and history, you can reach out to these light networks, you can uh, receive your balance, receive history, receive state, and send it uh, and return it in the exact same way. So for for the user using a JSON RPC call, it feels exactly the same, but it is possible with very, very limited resources. And uh, ours is called Ultralight. Uh, there's two other teams. One's called Trin. They're working in, uh, what are they? They're Rust and uh, client called Fluffy that is working in NIM. Um, so the cool thing about ours is that we can, we have a CLI client, but we also have it working in a browser. So we can open up a browser page to, you know, we built like a stupid, uh, just a small block explorer, but you open up your browser page to this thing and the browser itself becomes a portal client using the same kind of, um, same kind of memory and, and storage as anything else, and <clears throat> you know can both can both look up uh, look up and serve. Yeah, what else am I saying? Yeah, essentially your your app can be a portal client if you if you were to bake this into bake bake it into your app. It can basically just be running in the background. You don't even really have to think about it, but it's distributing the data among a large, large network of pockets and phones and laptops. Um, essentially taking a lot of the load off of full clients and, and making a lot of this data available in a much more lightweight way. Uh, we have been building the history network for the last year or so, and that is imminently operational. Um, and then the idea is that the other networks can just build upon that, but they will be independent networks. So as a portal client, you can participate in one or all of them. Um, you, can, you can be there as a freeloader and not contribute anything, and it really doesn't take much away from it. If you think about you know, BitTorrent, most people are... Most people don't really go into their torrent apps and change a lot of configurations to be selfish about it. Most people just download the thing and use it as it comes. And essentially, you don't even really have to know that it's happening, but you are serving the, the entire network yourself. Um, so that's, yeah, that's a, a side project, but it's very exciting and is definitely part of the future of how these things will work. Yes, sir. <laughs> So it's a distributed distributed hash table, both of content and user addresses. So for the most part, you're going to be randomly assigned an address in that in that sphere, and you can sort of configure the radius of, of data you're willing to be responsible for. Um, 
Yeah. So you you would be a peer on the network. You know, if you constrained yourself to only holding like a tiny bit of data, then you're not going to be asked for it very often. Um, there are certainly malicious ways to, you know, put a bunch of nodes up that aren't doing anything. But um, I don't know. The, the for, it just kind of means that we've built something worth attacking, first of all, and that there are, are solutions to those problems that can be worked out. Um, and just, uh, I think we're counting on the just general laziness of users that are going to download a wallet app that somebody made and not necessarily configure it to be like weirdly malicious. There's no incentives here. It's all just, it's all just there because it benefits users and by benefiting one user you benefit all users um, so yes there are ways to attack it there are ways to <sighs> be mean about it but I think for the most part as long as as long as enough users are just kind of passively participating then that's not as this isn't this isn't crucial to the protocol itself like portal network going down does not affect ethereum in any way um, so we can build this thing that's lightweight and hopefully just working on just working on like natural natural law essentially um, nobody really has anything to gain by trying to shut it down and it doesn't really affect anything um, yeah you know problems that we're working out we're uh, we're trying to steam ahead with like building the thing and then like uh, solve all of these problems along the way <clears throat> but yeah, please. Uh, our it's ultra late team is just two people. It's me and me and uh, Andrew from our team. So uh, we're always looking for help or for whatever kind of contributions are out there. Yeah, cool. Other questions on that before we move back to more like the, the actual Ethereum JS motor repo. So we uh, we have a concept of a bridge node, which is something that is um, is synced to the net and is or synced to the chain, and is just feeding feeding into the portal network. If we have enough of those, it just kind of saturates over time. We also have just kind of ideas of how to I don't know maybe like a babysitter node that kind of like circles the network and looks for gaps and and kind of helps helps fill in the gaps. Uh, but yeah, it's these kind of bridge nodes that originally saturate the network and maybe maintain that. Mm -hmm. The boot nodes are, uh, uh, we have DevOps just put up a bunch of nodes for us that, that are acting like boot nodes. Uh, there's no real difference between a bridge client and a just Regular client, it's more. Uh, are you are you doing this extra work to like add to the add to the network, or are you just helping to gossip around the network? Yeah. All right. So we'll we'll move ahead with a demo of Ethereum JS. So as you know, the next hard fork hard fork is going to be named uh, Shanghai. And there's a test net running at the moment. It was down for a couple of days, but it got back up, I think, this morning or last night. Uh, it's, a, it's a test net that basically implements a subset of the, uh, of the EIPs that are going to be part of Shanghai. So there might be additional ones, the one on this list at the moment, but the like, tentative like, list of EIPs that are going to be included at the moment is, is the one you see on the screen. So the beacon chain withdrawals and the deactivate self-destruct aren't implement, implemented yet in our, uh, in our client. But uh, yeah, the Shandong testnet is up and running. We have it running with Lodestar as a consensus uh, a client, which is like the TypeScript you know, uh, consensus client. And then we have it with uh, Ethereum JS as uh, the execution client. So that testnet is sold, it's live. Uh, you can look it up. There's a block explorer that I think we just put up this morning. Uh, and as far as I know, like the only execution client that's actually running that at the moment is uh, Ethereum uh, JS, so the JavaScript uh, client. So what I'll do is just uh, I will not like run. I will not access like the 
actual you know, live testnet, but I'll run like the testnet locally to give you a sense of how you would go about doing that. And you might be interested in running that yourself when we go into the more like interactive part of the workshop. So I just need to check out the proper pull request from our Mole repo. So it's just that here. So yeah, as we said, our mono repo is broken into, you know, packages. Can you see the VS code? Yeah, cool. Awesome. So we'll just go to the package client. And I have, you know, a couple of instructions I've I've done here. So basically what we first uh, want to do is we want to create, you know, data folders for both, you know, the execution layer data and the consistent data. Yeah. Uh, zoom in. I'm not sure if I can zoom in Notion actually, but I can definitely zoom in VS Code. So at least it's going to be that. Is that better? Yeah, cool. No worries. Oh yeah, yeah, they're actually available on that pull request and in a couple slides uh, there's a link tree with all of these uh, outlines so you definitely can access all of these nodes and yeah, it's it's a good exercise as well to, uh, you know, run that yourself. You will have time for that and we'll be happy to help everyone uh, get that running. So yeah, the first thing we want to do is just create some data folders where the, the state of the, you know, where the consensus client data and the execution client is going to live. So we're going to put that in the uh, data. Yeah, Shandong. So we're going to create an Ethereum folder and we're going to create the Lodestar folder as well. So now we're good to go for that part. So the next step is we're already going to start our uh, execution uh, like client. And it's going to use a uh, Genesis that's been uh, done by, by one of the guys on our on our team, usually likes Shandong and Genesis.json. You'll see that more clearly, like here. You're in packages. What? No, you're in packages. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're right. Thanks. Yeah, and there we go. Hopefully that works. Live coding is always a bit uh, <laughs> sketchy. And the, the Wi-Fi is pretty good. Actually, if you haven't noticed, there's a workshop-specific uh, Wi-Fi network that you can access because the, the global Wi-Fi isn't working that well. So yeah, we see that we have a JSON RPC server started because we started, you know, our client with the RPC, RPC engine, engine flag. Uh, we have a Genesis that we've uh, specified, and the data directory is Ethereum JS, which we've just cre created. So that's pretty uh, fairly simple. So uh, by default, when you run the Ethereum JS client, it's going to consider that the merge hard fork uh, has been activated because we've specified, you know, a Genesis after that. So at the moment, it's just waiting for a consensus layer client connection. Without that, it's going to be not going to be able to, you know, obviously execute blocks because it's not getting getting any. So this is exactly what we're going to do. We're going to start the Lodestar uh, consensus client. So uh, the first thing we need to do is we're going to need to specify the Genesis hash to the, um, to the consensus uh, layer client. So to, that, to do that, I'm actually going to bring up you know, Infura, and we're just going to query uh, the hash of the... Uh, I'm not going to bring up Infura, actually. I'm just going to query... Uh, the local RPC that we, we've seen specified here. You see uh, somewhere up here, start JSON RPC server, local host 8545. So I'm just going to do, this is just a tooling to like visualize, uh, you know, requests a bit better. So let's see if I can recall how to do that by heart. We'll see. So we're just going to send a standard like JSON RPC request to get the data of the, you know, the very first block in that, you know, exec exec execution client state. So method then is going to be, what is it? It's eat, get block by number. And if you see me make a typo, be sure to point it out so that we don't break our execution layer client by sending him like bad stuff. 
and um, so we're just going to specify, you know, the very first block we could specify earliest uh, as well. Uh, this second option is just if we want the transactions, we'll, we'll say yes, but it doesn't really uh, matter all that much. Uh, then we need to specify an ID, I think. We'll just go with one. Can you see properly? Yeah, cool, big enough. So let's see if that works. Cool, yeah. So we've got, you know, the first Genesis block. We should expect like the parent hash is gonna be zero. Uh, this is post uh, merge. So the mixed hash is zero. It's uh, it's unused. And the nonce is one, two, three, four. Not sure why that is, but that is probably like a default value or something. So we're just gonna take the hash and uh, yeah, we're just gonna copy and paste that. So then the only other thing that we need is we need to specify like an initial like timestamp. So I'm just going to quickly uh, get the timestamp like in seconds. And we're going to add like a, a few like seconds to that when we do that, you know, right after. So I'm going to start the consensus client here and this is a fairly, you know, long command it's running with uh, Docker. Like I've already installed Lowstar in my machine. I didn't want to do that, you know, here, but we can help you, you know, set that up later if that's what you want to do. So all that we're going to need to specify is we're going to need to specify the Genesis uh, eat one hash. And we actually have that from here. So we're pasting that. And then we are going to specify uh, uh, Genesis time, which is going to be that. And I'm going to add like a number of seconds to it. So let's see if this works. So we should eventually start, you know, producing uh, blocks. Oh, we see published block. That looks pretty good. And then if we go back to the execution layer client, it should have picked up on, you know, the consensus uh, client starting to run, producing blocks, sending them back uh, to it. So let's see if we, yeah, it's uh, assembling blocks, build block, that looks perfect. So we we are seeing that uh, we have a local uh, Shangdong blockchain running with a bunch of newer EIPs. Now, one thing we can do, we have a test suite, I think, for, it's back. Yeah, right. So we have a bunch of tests here that we can run to see if the you know EIPs have been properly uh, implemented. So I won't go through all of them. Uh, feel free to go uh, through them yourself. So EIP like 3670 is um, like the EOF uh, val code execution, uh, the code validation. So if you try to publish like a, a contract code that uh, doesn't conform to the EOF standard, it will get uh, you know, rejected. We have a bunch of related tests. We have, uh, I can't exactly recall what this one is. Actually a bad, uh, bad label here, just fix that. And yeah, so we can try and see if we can run that test. I think it's in the sim. Yeah. All right, so it should, Oh, I have to specify yeah. external run through. Yeah, right. So this is going to interact with the chain that we have running locally and check if uh, everything seems good. So we've been able to make a transfer. That's already, you know, not so bad. And then it's going to test EOF and uh, a couple of other you know, EIPs. This is a bit slow, maybe because I'm sharing the screen, I'm not sure. But yeah, we see that test uh, running. And yeah, I'll keep that running while I mm -hmm. keep it up, uh, go back to the presentation. Slideshow. All right. All right, so this is uh, where we're gonna start like the more interactive and I feel like interesting part of this uh, workshop where, I mean, we encourage you like to bring actually your laptops out. And if you have, if you don't have a laptop or you don't feel like, you know, coding yourself, 
I would really encourage you like to to meet up with someone or to pair with someone who actually has a a, a laptop going because I feel like that's probably going to be the best way that you can we can show you about the mono repo and if people have like different degrees of uh, of skill levels or familiarity with like blockchain in general we have a couple of like suggestions as to what we suggest you to do so if you're uh, and th that QR code is uh, the link tree I was mentioning earlier, so it has links to all all of these things along with uh, like Shandong testnet instructions. I also want to mention uh, the structure of our mono repo. You can clone the whole mono repo, and it'll come with what is it twelve packages? So all all of the relevant packages will come in the mono repo if you clone that from GitHub. But each individual package is also installable on its own. Um, so you can you can install just the transaction package or just the block package, and you don't need to have the whole mono repo as a dependency. You can have each individual ETH JS package. Um, yeah, yeah. Exactly. But I would encourage you today to maybe clone the whole mono repo so you can see everything and and get a sense of how they all connect to each other. Yeah, yeah. Cloning the mono repo is probably the way to go if you want to experiment a bit, especially since some of these packages are inter interdependent on you know each other. But if you were, for example, building a set of tooling and you only need to build blocks from data or build transactions from some piece of data that you have, you could only import like at Ethereum uh, block in that Ethereum transaction, and that would be you know all that you need. You don't need to you know import the whole mono repo. It's just package based. So yeah, what we have like sort of prepared for you in terms of uh, like paths. If you're more like uh, I wouldn't say beginner, but like if you're more novice or if you've never really learned about you know Merkel Patricia trees, uh, a good way like to explore that is with a tutorial that uh, had been written like two years ago and has been like uh, updated recently. And it basically goes through, it uses our tree package to teach you about the very fundamentals of that data structure. So it just starts with, you know, uh, putting a value inside the, the Merkle Patricia uh, database, uh, getting that value, uh, computing a hash, looking how you can, you know, make proofs from these hashes, eventually all the way up to, uh, you know, querying data on the blockchain and, uh, in interacting with it uh, more dynamically in a way that's more uh, similar to what you'd expect in the real world uh, context. So uh, I'm super happy to help you as well uh, answer any questions on trees. It's the package I, I've worked the most on. Uh, in the more, I guess, intermediate track, although I mean, Merkle Patricia's are certainly like not super easy, so it, we could have put that in the intermediate track as well. Uh, you can experiment with like RLP uh, encoding or decoding. Uh, so this is the serializing uh, algorithm currently used by Ethereum. And we cover a bit of that in the Merkle Patricia Trees tutorial. But uh, if you want to experiment with like, oh, what does a, an array containing a dog and cat strings uh, look like when you RLP encode them, that's the package you would go for. It contains two methods, RLP.encode, RLP.decode. Super simple. And you have a bunch of helpers like to convert hex to strings and stuff like that. Uh, another, I feel like, exciting thing that you could uh, use our packages for is uh, the block and the transaction packages. One of the things you could do, for example, is query, uh, you know, just like we've done here, we've queried the block. So a good exercise would be to recompute the hash of that block from that data. We have helpers that can do it for you uh, like super easily where you basically just paste that JSON object and it's going to recompute like the hash or a block object for which you can get the hash. But it's also, uh, it can also be interesting to just take those fields like manually and try to recompute the hash yourself. And we have all the helper methods you would, you would need to, to do that. And if that feels a bit, a bit hard, you can look at how we actually implement our helper methods and, you know, try that out. Let me go back to the, yeah. All right. In the more uh, advanced, I guess, track, one of the things you could do is uh, invent and implement your own EIP. Well, that, might, that might look like super uh, hard, but uh, we have an example here of a super like minimalistic uh, EIP. And I'm actually going to show that to you just so that you see how small like uh, potential 
EIP can be. So I think it's 18, 14. Yeah, right. So it's adding like 92 lines of code, removing two. Pretty simple. It's an EIP that goes into Shanghai, just warms the Coinbase address. So if you take this as a as an example, you're I think you're easily going to be able to you know reproduce at least the scaffolding for an EIP, and uh, you can like invent this perhaps not so useful, but like easy one where it just modifies the way maybe a block is run, it maybe modifies uh, the name of field or something like that. And uh, yeah, that I think that PR can serve as a guideline for how to do that. And yeah, most of the implementation is actually like, it's basically just that line here in addition to like the scaffolding and a bunch of tests that are just confirmed that the EIP has been implemented properly. In terms of other things that you could do, you can uh, run the local client uh, as we, you've seen us do, and you can run the Shandong uh, testnet with Lodestar as the consensus uh, client. So, yeah, now it's off uh, to the races, as Richard always says. <laughs> so, any uh, does everyone raise your hand if you don't have a laptop? Well, I have one, so I won't raise my hand. <laughs> So everyone has one. Awesome. So was everyone able to scan that uh, link tree thing? All right, cool. If not, the link is just link, linktr.ee uh, slash ethereum.js. Let me just bring it up. All right. All right. So do I'm wondering how to best like structure this. So either I can go through one of those myself for those who want to more uh, follow along but I think what would be helpful is maybe if we just help everyone you know set up a local environment and if uh, at some point you want to follow with what I'm doing you can do it or if you want to work on your own thing you can do it as well does that sound good to everybody yeah all right cool all right just gonna walk around might not be best for the live stream. Not that interesting to, to watch an empty <laughs> stage, but uh, I will be walking around. And just raise your hand if you have uh, an issue setting up your local environment. Just clone the mono repo. It's linked at, uh, so if you click on intermediate, it, it's gonna bring you to uh, the mono repo itself. All right, all right. And once you've cloned the uh, Mono repo, the way to install it, we use npm. So just npm install. Uh, is anyone running on Windows? Very happy to hear that. Oh, yeah, <laughs> there's the door. Yeah, for Windows users. So he's, I assume people are on uh, Mac OS or Linux. Or yeah, yeah. Okay, the, the workshop Wi-Fi's password is uh, build it 22. Uh, lower caps, build it and 22, the, the number. So just npm install from the mono repo itself. Make sure to run npm install in the, you know, mono repo instead of in packages themselves. So that's going to build the whole thing, which is what we want. Is everyone good? Raise your hand if you need additional help. Okay, so I think you just entered. So yeah, just uh, you can clone the Ethereum JS Mono repo. Uh, the second link, intermediate link in the uh, in the link tree that you see here, and then uh, yeah, just uh, make sure you're on the you're on the master branch. That should be default, and then. Uh, yeah, just pull the latest and npm i to install the mono repo. That should be all that you need. So just just so I, that I do something that's relevant for most people, who's thinking of doing the uh, Merkle Patricia trees tutorial? Awesome. Okay, cool. It, I would quite recommend it. It does cover some of the stuff that were. Uh, 
we would be doing in block transactions and RLP, but it just guides you through them rather than just throwing you out there. Uh, who's thinking of just going straight intermediate and building blocks transactions? All right. And uh, who's thinking of trying to implement their own EIP? Is anyone motivated? All right, awesome. <laughs> and uh, what about running the client or running the Shandong testnet? Okay, yeah, so I'll just be going through the tutorial as well in front since everyone is gonna be doing that. And it's gonna be more interesting for people who watch the recording rather than just looking at the link tree for one hour. Yeah, so this is the folder that you uh, should go in if you want to do that tutorial. And the README is, is, you know, the tutorial itself. What we also have is a set of examples. Like I had uh, written this tutorial in, in JavaScript just so that people who you know, wanted to learn about Ethereum didn't know about TypeScript, didn't really have to, you know, uh, learn about it. So those are like JS files that you can just run with a node. So let me check out. Yeah, package is named uh, try. So once you've, uh, let me actually just reinstall since the Shandong thing is a bit, uh, a bit different. Yeah, was everyone able to install successfully? Cool, no issues. Huh? You're waiting for the installation? All right, cool. Yeah, it takes a while because it's building every package, so. Uh, Uh, are you trying to run uh, from the monorepo itself, npm run test? Uh, yeah, it might be just uh, because of the submodules. Indeed, like uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the general tests we have depend on that uh, those submodules. Uh, yeah, they're pretty big. They're pretty big. Uh, I can't say for sure. Like depending on the bandwidth, how long it's going to take. Uh, my own machine at home, it doesn't take that long. But uh, you can just leave it running and see if uh... oh oh that's singular test okay uh, let me give you an example of running uh, an individual uh, test I'll just go Okay, the, the, the principle is gonna be the same for all of the packages themselves. So if you go within the individual package that you're trying to run the test in, just do npm run tape, and tape is like the testing you know framework that we use. Then you do uh, double, I think those are called dash in English, I'm not even sure. Uh, then uh, test to look at the test folder, and then you just select the file basically that you, uh, that you want to run, right? So if I wanted to run, for example, the, the I don't know, the, the, the proof that spec test, I would just do that, and it's gonna run that test uh, individually. Uh, if you do NPM run test, it's just gonna run like a massive suite of, um, of tests, including like integration tests that depend on browser integration, stuff like that, and that's typically like super long. We only do that like in, in the CI once in a while. But uh, locally, it's a bit tedious. So, and yeah, then you see the the, the result of the test; uh, it passes. So let me close that up. All right. So let me open up the tutorial again. All right. So there's, you know, a bit of preliminary info that you might want to read. Uh, you know, data structure of Ethereum is called a Merkle Patricia tree. It's uh, basically a combination of a Merkle tree and a Patricia try. A try is a data structure in which keys represent the path leading to a, a specific uh, node. And the Merkle tree is a structure in which uh, a parent uh, node 
uh, the key of that is the hash of the all the child nodes. Uh, Merkle tree is interesting because if you want to prove that a certain value is part of the data, uh, the large Merkle tree structure that you have, you can do so by providing uh, a bunch of like sister nodes. We'll see uh, that super clearly in the tutorial itself. So yeah, the instructions are here. They're the same that you've just run. So clone the Mono repo, um, uh, install it, and then go inside of the try package. So I'll be going through these like fairly, you know, slowly. So feel free if you're, you know, want to go a bit faster to just go forward and don't let me like slow you down. But the so the first example we're going to use the try, you know, library for is uh, creating and updating. Uh, a base try. Uh, so what does that look like? So first of all, we're importing the try uh, class from the, the try package. And we can look at what, you know, that looks like. It's probably like try file, yeah. So try is simply a class. And, uh, you know, it has a, a bunch of properties that you would expect uh, on the, you know, database-like structure. It does use like a checkpoint DB as a as like a database, and then you can provide options for the tree. So some of the options are: uh, Do you want to use this specific type of uh, keys? Do you want to use like plain keys or hashed keys, like are what is used in Ethereum? Then we instantiate the database. You could provide like your own database. Here we're instantiating a new like MapDB, and um, and yeah, instantiating a new tree when we, you know, construct uh, a tree with the tree class. And you can see you have a set of methods here. You can, for example, you know, get the root uh, of the tree. Uh, you can verify if a certain root exists. You can get, those are like these two methods are the ones we're going to be using the most. So we have a get method to retrieve a value uh, by providing a key. And then we have a, a put uh, a put method, which stores a given value at a specific key. So fairly standard, you know, database stuff. But this is going to give us insight into how you know the, that actual data structure works, because it's not like a simple database. So let me go back to the tutorial. So the first thing we're going to do is like instantiate uh, the tree. So I'll go to take this example one a. I'm just going to comment that out. So yeah, to run a specific example, you're just going to go uh, node examples. And for example, example one, am I doing a typo? Oh yeah, it's within Merkle for sure trees. And then example one, a. there we go. So this, all I'm going to be doing here, as you can see, is instantiating a new tree uh, with, you know, the, the, the try package from the Mono repo, and then logging the root of that tree. And this is going to give us the, the, the root of the tree, which is, uh, you can look up in the docs, but it's basically the, 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 the encoding of, uh, I think, an empty array, um, RLP encoding of an empty array. So, yeah, we see, like, Pretty fast. We see we output a buffer, which is uh, which is that. Now that doesn't tell us a whole lot, but we could lo look up in the docs and see that this is actually exactly what we'd expect in uh, as the root of a genesis like root of a of the try like data data structure. So then we're going to move on to a more you know more interesting test. I'd say we're gonna we're gonna try to just put a value in it and see if we can actually retrieve it. Another thing we're also gonna be able to see is uh, how the, the root you know, has been updated, given that. So yeah, what do we do here? We're creating a key. I mean, a try natively uses buffers, so we're doing like buffer from for, for all of these. So we're having test key, that's gonna be our key, and we have test value, this is gonna be our value. And then we're doing an asynchronous operation, like putting that uh, key value pair inside of the try. And then we're going to try to retrieve that value. Fairly simple. What we should expect here 
is uh, so what should be the value? Well, it should be the, the you know the encoded version, uh, the buffer from version of uh, test value, and the value string we should expect to see value. And if we don't, there's there's been an issue either you know in the library or in the way we've uh, used it. It should also update the tree root. So one thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna also log. The try root before, and what we should expect is uh, like each Merkle partition tree, like each state tree, should always have a different uh, hash if it differs, and if it's the same, it should always uh, have the, the the same. So let's try running this again. So what do we have here? We start with a empty uh, try root. Yeah, we had logged that before actually. So the try root before, you know, is the same. We just log the same thing twice. The value that we've retrieved is it's this. If you are familiar with, uh, you know, this just uh, the, the hex correspondence for all of the all of the uh, characters, and then if we uh, convert that to a string, we get back this value. This is exactly what we expect. Then we see that the try root has you know, massively change as, as you would expect from uh, any kind of hashing. If it differs slightly, totally different random result. All right, that clear to everybody? Does that feel intuitive? Yeah, any questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, we're always at, so an, a normal tree, so this is the actual merkle Petrus tree, like data structure that we'd be, uh, that would be used like in production with Ethereum. The, the, the only slight difference is that uh, merkle Petrus trees use like hashed keys. So instead of using the key, we'd use like the, the, the hashed version of, of that key. And this is only to balance out the tree so that there's no vector of attack where you always update like uh, values in a similar region and make it more costly for nodes to run operations. Um, the so what I think your question is is you know there are there's a if you had a normal data structure like this you would always like traverse every single node would only give you one hex right uh, because it's a sixteen like width uh, tree so if you have a key of like uh, you know thirty two bytes then you would traverse like all, all these nodes on, on the way down there now Merkle Patricia trees are more efficient than that because if if they know that given a certain path, there's only one possible path down, they're gonna create what's called uh, an extension node, which extends all the way down to the, to the leaf. So this allows you to shortcut unnecessary paths. What you'd see if you didn't have that is there would be a bunch of layers in their Merkle partition tree where there's only like one specific branch that has a value, and then you go down and there's only one specific branch. So for like sparse trees, meaning like trees that aren't filled like with, with data all over, this is incredibly more you know efficient because you don't have to store like all these unnecessary nodes. That and just collapse collapse those back up into into one leaf instead of a tree with only one leaf. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I'll go ahead and check what example two uh, is about. Yeah, there's a couple of additional like notes here that you might be interested in. Some of them I mentioned while while doing it. Uh, it's also talking a bit about the RLP, you know, encoding uh, uh, function. This is actually not up to date. I think. I think it's probably here. Yeah, yeah. So there are some very nice docs in uh, on Ethereum.org for developers. Like if you're looking to learn a bit more about RLP, you would just go there, they have a bunch of examples, and you can even like use our library to test it out and play around with it. Uh, so before values or so there's a bunch of values you could want to store in the Merkle Patricia tree, right? And those need to be serialized before they are, you know, uh, put inside of the tree. Uh, this serialization is done with the uh, recursive length uh, prefix uh, encoding function. Uh, and and yeah, as I mentioned, uh, 
uh, keys also go in additional additional transformation. Uh, they're not used like raw. Uh, they're used. Uh, we we first take the Kekak 256 of, of the key before we we update the tree. So here we're basically going to do the same thing, but we are going to use the hashed uh, version of the key. So how we're going to do that is we're we're just going to you know, import the Kekak 256 that we have in, you know, Ethereum JS slash uh, util package. And the only difference is we are going to, uh, as you see here, uh, put the value at the Kekak of the key instead of the key itself. So everything else is going to be, uh, you know, exactly uh, the same. So let's see. Yeah, similarly, we're going to get, you know, an updated tree root. So that, you know, nothing surprising here. Uh, it's basically just, you know, we we had an alternative key, which is the KKAG of the key. We got the same value back. No difference there. Any question on that? Okay, so the the values themselves aren't hashed because otherwise we wouldn't be able to retrieve them since you know hashing is one way. Uh, the only thing that we hash is, I mean, this is like a key value, you know, data structure. Uh, the value we keep, you know, uh, native, we just RLP encoded for you know serialization so that it's compatible. But the the key itself that we're hashing, we could very well well have a, a Merkle patchetry like data structure without hash keys. And however, at the you know early days of Ethereum, it was chosen that the keys are gonna were gonna be hashed. Uh, the main reason why that, why that was done is so that it uh, evens out uh, the tree uh, naturally. So it, it mitigated like vectors of attack where you could have mm -hmm. people like constantly update like uh, a, a part of the tree like very easily. And now if you wanted to do that, you'd have to like pre-compute uh, a hash. And since it's like non-deterministic, well, it's deterministic, but you can like predict in advance what the hash is going to be, obviously. You'd basically have to do like proof of work to like uh, uh, target like a specific part of the tree. It, it imposes some randomness on the, the actual address. And so if you have keys that are related, they won't cluster in a part of the tree, they'll, they'll be dispersed evenly. And your key can be a short string and it ends up 32 bytes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so in our case, like keys are always like addresses, like in the case of the, the, the state tree keys would be like the, the, the account addresses. But uh, yeah, the Kekak, uh, like hashing something obviously also has the benefit of making everything equal length which you want in like data structures like this. All right, so as we said, like fairly, fairly straightforward. Now we're gonna do something, you know, a little bit more interesting. Now what we've seen is that the, the like we've used the KAKAK 256 uh, of the key, but there's a, you know, there's a, a property of the tree that we can just use in order to do that natively. That property is called use key hashing. It's a Boolean that defaults to false, but as you can set to true uh, if you want. When playing around with a tree, it's just more convenient to set it to false or have it, you know, default to false, just because you you don't have like to do all do all that additional computation. It's also easier if you want to debug uh, what a value. Uh, you know, if you if you only have the the hash of the key, you can never know like what was the actual key that I used to update this. You cannot retrieve it back, which uh, is actually an issue that has also come up when making the transition from Merkle trees to Virgil trees. But that's a different uh, that's a different topic. <laughs> 
All right, so let's see what example 1C is about. So well, I think it's basically the same thing, but just using the use key hashing. So what we should expect, unless our use key hashing Boolean is implemented improperly, <laughs> is we should expect exactly the, the, the same uh, values as we have here, including the updated tree root, given that we are using the same, yeah, test key and this value, the, that should work. So let's see. And yeah, as expected, we've created a new tree, but we've updated it with the same key value pair, and we are getting the same updated tree, uh, try root. Okay. Now we're going to do a, a different operation. So among the operations that are possible, you can retrieve a value, you can update the tree by adding new values, you can also delete values from the tree. So let's see what this looks like. The As I... As I kind of mentioned before, every tree that is similar, that has all the same data, should, you know, compute the same root. That's how we get, you know, the security properties of these, uh, of these trees. So what we're going to do is we're going to update the tree, it's going to update the root, and then we're going to delete that same key, and it should give us back the exact same root that we started with. Let's look at the code. All right, yeah, we create it, update it, then delete using the wait deal uh, helper method, get it again. We, we shouldn't be getting uh, a value when we try to, you know, retrieve uh, at that key. I'm not exactly sure what we're going to get. I'm not sure if it throws or, oh, it looks like, yeah, it's going to be null. Fair enough. And uh, let's see about that. All right. So we are starting out with the M3 empty try root here. It starts with 56 E8. Then we are updating uh, the tree. We're getting uh, an updated tree root, which is uh, similar to the like unhashed key one we had before. And then we are deleting that value again. And what do we get back when we query that, um, that tree for that key? We, uh, we get back null, which means like, Empty, no, uh, it's not there. And the tree root that we get back after the deletion is the same that we start with. So yeah, it kind of demonstrates that every you know same tree is going to have the same root. Yeah. So now we're going to take a bit of a deeper look at the actual you know data structure of a. Uh, the Merkle Budget Tree. So it has, do you want to go over this? Or? Uh, you want me to take over? <laughs> if, you want, if you want, I feel like I've been talking about it. No, you're, you're a good communicator, you should do it. <laughs> all right, all right. So there are four kinds of nodes in uh, Merkle Budget Trees. So there's the null node, which is the one we just queried accidentally by you know deleting the tree. That's a non-existent node. You get back null when you query for something that doesn't exist. There is a branch node. What a branch node does is it's basically an intermediary node that points to a bunch of child nodes. There is then a leaf node, which is, you know, the, this is called the tree, and the leaves are the very end. These are the nodes that contain, like, the, you know, the final values. And then there are extension nodes. Extension nodes are the shortcut uh, I was kind of hinting to. So if... Um, if you have a key, for example, I mean, we're going to see examples, actually, so it might be easier. Any question before we dive into looking? We're going to look at all these four different kinds of nodes individually. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, how, how is that initial root uh, created? Yeah, good question. I'm, I think it's the RLP encoding, like it, it has basically still, uh, you know, it's, it's the hash of the value at that root because it, it's initialized with a value. If it wasn't initialized with a value, it would just be null, you know, initially. Uh, the, the way they're defined. Yeah. 
Uh, I'm sorry, are you asking about the extension node, like how, how that route comes to be? Or... The very first, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so how, how would we able to calculate ourselves like manually the hash of the, the root node, the empty root node? Of an empty tree. Yeah. So, so yeah, we can actually look at that directly in the code. Uh, we have, uh, we set empty try root. That's like a specific like constant property. When, so when we construct, uh, when we initialize a new tree, what runs is like this constructor function. Um, if we don't provide options, uh, we, we have like default options that we provide. Uh, we instantiate the database and then the very next thing we do is initialize the empty try root, which is exactly the thing you know, you're uh, asking about. Uh, this is actually quite simple. So what it is, is uh, the RLP encoding of an empty string, which... Uh, it's in constants. Yeah. yeah, constants, okay. So it's buffer OX80. And that's, that's like, a, I guess, sort it's of a... Universal for empty tree. Yeah. <laughs> or yeah, empty, so we, if, empty RLP. Well, it... That's it's actually that's the idea. a desirable property. Yeah, that all you can know if an, you could identify all empty trees from exactly that, right? Like uh, the same tree should always have the same root. Same with an empty tree. Every empty tree will have the same root. Yeah, yeah. And if we let me take that example file actually and just compute that you know. We're gonna need what? We're gonna need something from RLP. Let me do it in the RLP package actually. Yeah, I'm having a bit of trouble navigating with my screen, so uh, zoomed in. Feel free to throw out questions or call me over if you want to chat individually. All right. So this is importing the encode method from the RLP library. So what do we should expect to get back uh, from you know an empty string? Um, RLP encoding would be OX80, which is, you know, the buffer we, we, we just saw before. So I'm going to have to move out of that repo, go into the examples folder, and then run this. Oh. Am I not in the right? Oh, it's test. test. Okay, so why is it not logging? Always interesting when you do uh, live coding. <laughs> you know, figure out how to console log something. Yeah, I switched package uh, before I did that. I can just actually import. Yeah, I'll just import it directly from uh, the, this. Oh, it's actually in bin for that folder. Mm -hmm. 
All right, let's see if we can get something going now. Rename that to uh, JS file, actually. All right, it is not working at all. Um, all right. We're finally you got it. <laughs> getting back something. Now we're getting back uh, 128. Is that OX80 in hex? Let me actually look that up. I do believe in it. Oh, yeah, it's going to be hard to import packages in a JS file like that. just look up. Okay, yeah, so 128, we, we got back the decimal value, but 128 is like OX80 in decimals, which is the, the, the value that we're using inside of the tree to compute the root hash. So we are basically just to, to compute that you know root hash, we are just hashing OX80. So if we take the Kekak hash of the let me look back at a place where we were using kickcock so I don't have to re-import manually. So if we're doing the kickcock 256 of a buffer from like OX80, we should expect to get back the exact same like uh, empty hash that serves as uh, the root of an empty Merkle Patricia tree. So let's see if we can reproduce that, you know, ourselves. We'll just comment out the rest to remove some noise. Navigate back to the tree package. Maybe I have to put that as a string. All right, so we're getting back a uint array. I just need to convert that to a hex. And then we should be getting back the, the same route that we initially started with. We have a buffer to hex uh, util in the package. Now, the way my testing thing is set up might not allow me to import that. Yeah, so I would need to do buffer to hex here. Uh, well, since I'm now running on a like JS thing, I, I would need to build it before I'm able to run this. So I will not do this here. But those are we can trust that you know the values that are output here. If you were to convert every one of them in you know in hex would be the exact values of the the root of the of the Merkle Pusher tree that we had in uh, the example D. Like yeah, fifty six E eight that thing here. Is that a satisfactory answer to your question? Are you Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, any other questions before we move on to going to all uh, specific kinds of nodes? We're good. All right. Cool. Everybody's following along. All right. Nice. So yeah, we're just going to start with uh, creating and looking up uh, null node. 
So how do we, we're not actually really gonna create a null node, we're just gonna query for a key that is not present in the Merkle partition tree. So it's basically the simplest like test case you could imagine. So what we're gonna run is a two to a right. Let's look just at the That's here. Yeah, so we're instantiating a new tree. Uh, we are trying to find the path, you know, to the uh, to the key uh, test key, and we'll see uh, what kind of node we get back. Now, what you will see now is that we're using find path, which is going to provide us with uh, the actual node and the node object instead of just providing us with the value. So, if you want to query the, the tree for actual values, just do get. But if you want to get more information as to you know what the path is and what the node looks like, you would just do uh, find path. So we're running uh, example A. This provides us with uh, yeah a null node as we would uh, expect. We could change that to uh, pretty much you know anything, and uh, we would get back null as well. No difference. Now one thing I'm going to try actually is if I query buffer from that, I'm not sure if that's going to be a null node as well. Yeah, okay, that's a null node. Interesting. Oh yeah, the thing we were uh, using before. Yeah, I think it's still null. It's since it, it's like defined as, you know, the, the initial hash is defined as that, but there's no actual node that's present uh, and that key from what I can recall of the specs. So there. Yeah. Yeah. It's basically a way to bootstrap the tree so that it starts, you know, w with something. Uh, you could define like a new Merkle Petri tree data structure <laughs> that uses like something different, obviously, from RLP encoding and also has a different like root hash. You don't necessarily have to use it. It's useful in the context of Ethereum because we obviously want to be consistent throughout like implementations, but it's not, it's not a necessary part of a data structure like that. You could define it anyway, any way that you want. So yeah, the null node is a bit, you know, uh, boring. It's not as interesting in the ones that are to come. Uh, it's also like slightly more complicated to, to create because if you think about how, you know, these kind of keys work, right? You have a key and to retrieve the value for it, you just go down, each node is a, a hex value, right? So let's say the next part of the key is like seven, you go branch number seven. And then if it's, uh, you know, four, like in this example, you take branch number four and you go all the way down. Now, since like Merkle push trees are like optimized with extension nodes, uh, you wouldn't get uh, a branch every part of the way down. What you would see is you would start at seven. Let's say you only have like one of the keys. You would start at seven. It would give you straight, it would go you straight to the end because there's only one value that starts with seven. So it would like kind of compress the tree for you. Uh, so if we want to create a branch node that's like acts as an intermediary node, you would want to, you know, we want to store keys that are all basically in the same spot and then branch out at some point. And that's actually interesting because it's super easy to do that, you know, with what we're going to do in this example. But if we were using a hash tree, then it's basically, you know, impossible mm -hmm. to do that, do that voluntarily. And that gives you a sense of why that was chosen in the first place, right? Why we're choosing... Uh, to hash keys in the context of like a production, you know, database in Ethereum to prevent like DOS style attacks with, uh, you know, just putting keys always in the same spot. All right, so let's look at that actual example, example 2B. Yeah, I'm not saving any of that. Well, it is that like native format that this tree accepts. Like it could do it, like we could have an implementation that just basically allows you to input anything, but it would still be converted into something that natively ingestible by the tree. So the tree is defined as a like hexary, hexary tree, meaning that every key must be like hexadecimal 
for it to be like conformed to the data structure. If we didn't have hexadecimal values, we'd have to convert it anyways, so that I mean, uh, so that it maps to like a 16, uh, 16 width uh, uh, key. So yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, and also like RLP encoding encodes things in hexadecimal. So we're all like working with native like hexadecimals here uh, within that tree. Uh, so yeah, if we, like unlike like hashes, uh, uh, buffer is gonna be, it's just like the, the hexary like encoding of the these keys. So we should expect these, uh, all these values to still be quite similar. And that is what we see here. So right, we have, the prefix test key is coming for all of them, and test key is basically that part, you know, of the. Uh, let me zoom in a little bit. Yeah, that part of the of the buffer. Now we have 30, which is a uh, zero, and 41, which is capital A, mm -hmm. which are you know the the last parts of it. So what we should basically expect, right, is a. Uh, would you agree that we should expect like a branch node at 79, at which point you know it branches out. So what we would see is like there's going to be a value at 79. A branch node, you know, can have a value, but then there's going to be two paths. There's going to be path number three and path number four, like in indexes of the, of the array. Then it's going to go down all the way to you know a leaf node because it's basically the end of the path for that part of the path, and then 41, which is going to be the end of the part for that you know other path. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's really the idea of the the Patricia tree is that you're following the sort of following the keys along that path and everything that shares shares bytes. Yeah, and something like to mention here, this is only keys, right? This is not the values themselves. And if, like later a bit in the tutorial, we see how, you know, the hashes of every like parent is computed, which is like different, you know, from this. But uh, yeah, so if we had like uh, also a, a key at just T, we would see like that that would be only 74 because that's like lowercase t is 74 uh, in hex. And uh, we would see a branch node at 74. There would be value already there. And then there would be like nodes, uh, like paths to uh, all the way down to, you know, 79. It would be like, we'll see that after, but it would be like an ex extension node for optimization purposes. And then you have, well, branches, as we've said, to 30 and, and 41. So, so yeah, what we're going to do is update the tree with all those keys. We're going to find the path to test key. And we're going to see what that node, you know, actually uh, looks like. All right, so that's actually a pretty nice like visualization, I think, of what's uh, of what's going on. So we have you know first the tree buffers, then we're updating with all those tree keys. So we're updating the tree with test key, test key zero, test key eight, which all have the same prefix. We query the the, the node that lives at key test key, which is the the common prefix for all of those. So what we see, so this is index you know zero, one, two, three, four which correspond to numerical values like just plus one since indexes start at zero. And uh, actually, no, that's not true. It just correspond exactly to the actual values. And, uh, and we're seeing that there are two uh, different you know, values here. So that is what we'd expect. We have like, this is basically like empty. So like null nodes because there's no path uh, at that point. Like, uh, at key zero, there's no, we don't have any, anything uh, that lives at zero, right? We don't have anything that lives at one. So we have nothing that lives at two, but starting from three, we have an actual path. And we see that complete path here. We also have the same for, 
41, which is, you know, index four. And then we have nothing all the way down. An interesting thing is we also have a value already here at address, you know, that's basically test key and hex. So a branch node is not only an intermediary node, it can also contain values, you know, itself. In the case of keys, which would always have the same length, you, you might not see like values at an intermediary node because they all leave on leaf nodes, but you can st still use that data structure for other purposes where, you know, the length of keys wouldn't always be the same. All right, yeah, so that's exa exactly uh, what we see. And we can, uh, we can take the value of that node and see if we can, like the value here, we can, uh, yeah, we can parse it to string. Let me find you the code so it's more revelatory of what's actually going on. So yeah, we, we, we found a path, we found a node, we take that node, we look at the value at that specific point, and it should be the, the value that we've put at test key. Now, if we were to take uh, 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 the value of, uh, of one of the nodes that is a child of that parent node, we would get also like test, key, test value zero and test value A. So it is what we're doing you know, a bit further down here. So let's look at how we're you know, retrieving that. We are taking, you know, the third branch and the the, the second element. That's just the, the that's the value of the, the of that leaf end node, converting it to a string, and then we get we retrieve the the value back. Is that somewhat clear? Branch nodes are a bit trickier, but is uh, is everyone sort of following along? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so let me... I think we're... There's a bit more clarity about that after. So I think the next example is going to clarify that for you. And if it doesn't, we can come back to it and, and play uh, a little bit more with it. It is like getting like nodes and how they're structured and how they, they operate within one another is the trickier part. But uh, yeah, branch nodes and extension nodes, which are you know, somewhat similar in structure, are the more complicated part of that. So once you get that and it kind of clicks the way they work together, mm -hmm. you're pretty much you know done understanding that that data structure. So it's definitely something that's worth you know coming back to and making sure that we understand. So when you yeah, if you see that array of sixteen buffers and two of them have have keys in them. Every every parent, as soon as that branch is out, has automatically sixteen children, regardless of how many values are actually there and like where they go. If there's only one, then we can compress it down and call it an extension node. But here, where there's like two in that array, you just automatically have the rest. Rest of its siblings are empty buffers. Um, and like I said, if there's only one child to that parent we can collapse it back up if there's at least two then you're going to have an array of 16 um, regardless of how many actually have actually have a, a leaf yeah yeah absolutely so this uh clarifies this is a bit like in in the other example but i think this clarifies uh you know what's going on so it might look a bit confusing because we're using very similar keys and values so this is actually the values and they're also you know similar but we're not really concerned with the similarity you know of the values we're concerned with we went all the way down to a branch node we had two paths that were defined and we had uh, also a value that lived there so your question is basically well why, why is it an array that lives there right so the array contains the two pieces of information that we need to finally like get the value at the, at the leaf node. So this is pointing, you know, to a node and it's telling you, well, actually the, the, the remaining part of the path is going to be three, zero. 
and then the remaining part of the path is going to be you know tree one and then the value you're going to tree, retrieve at that you know end and point is going to be you know that whole thing and this is the thing that if you, you know, parse it to a string you would get like test value zero and test value a and it's the reason why when we're um, trying to retrieve you know the values here we are you know taking the corresponding indexes but uh, then taking the first uh, the, not the first like the second but index number one this this is exactly that's the value now we're working with like fairly small values so the values are directly inside of the tree if you had very large values it, it would point like back to another uh, node that would have an encoding of the of the value uh, well at that point it would be like the end node so it would only be a leaf so all the leaf contains is the the, the last remaining part of the path that was that led there and then the full uh, value And then, it, yeah, that'll be the root of, yeah. Yeah, yeah, let's do that, actually. So we can, we're going to create, uh, so what would you suggest? Test key 01? Yeah. Yeah. Let's do that. It's going to be test value, you know, 01 as well. And actually, let me put, like, some fairly like different values so that we're not confused by the similarity of mm -hmm. the values themselves i think that the values be... themselves don't determine where it is in the tree yeah so we're gonna run that again and we're gonna all that we're interested in at the moment for you know this example you've suggested is the the, the branch node like what does it look like at that point and then it's gonna have a child that's also going to be uh, a branch node right that's what we would you know expect so let's try uh, I need to save it first. Let's try running that. All right. So what we see is it's actually quite similar to what it was before. But instead of getting an array, we're getting a larger, larger buffer. So what is that larger buffer? That larger buffer is... Uh, now, there's two kinds of keys in Mergle Pitch trees. That's just a hash that points to a different node, right? So it's not about, you know, path. Path is still like path, you know, number three. But to know, like, what's the hash of that other node that we're trying to retrieve, this is going to be that. So that's just a hash of the, 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 of the, the, the child node that is going to be the one that contains, you know, zero. Uh, what was it? Like zero and zero, zero, one, right? So now... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's see how we can go about. What I'll do next is look at the path at test key zero, right? And we're going to look at what you know that actual node uh, looks like. I can also remove that. Right. So what do we have here? What am I logging? Okay. So if we look at those keys, you have a common path that is test key zero, and then you have a slightly like longer path that is test key one. So what we should expect again is a branch node at that point. It's going to contain the value itself because test key zero is actually defined, you know, as a valid key that contains a value, but it's also going to continue at uh, one. And now, obviously, we're dealing with like hex conversions of this, so it's not going to be at the actual index one. It's going to be at a different index. But we we do see that there's uh, exactly one 
uh, valid you know, branch that points to uh, another node. And then there's an actual value here. And if we were to uh, you know, convert that actual value to a string, we would expect to get back uh, whatever, like gar badge I, I typed in there. And this is exactly what we retrieve here. And if we look at this, this branch, we're going to try to retrieve that you know, number three thing here. I can just do it. So what's the index of this? It looks like, okay, index three. I have to do actually branches true. And then this would be the remaining part of the path. And this is going to be the value. So if we do to string, we should expect to retrieve that uh, number three you know, thing that we had above. Let's see if that works. And yeah, we're getting back, you know, uh, number three. Uh, well, I kind of messed this up. I should have commented this out. So it could very well, like if I choose, if I do two here, and we go back to the login, I don't think it's actually coming up with enough index to have a number three. Can you, can you repeat that? Being displayed. Mm -hmm. And you have... Uh, uh, ref referring to the branches in the terminal, right? Like we have uh, buffer placeholders and uh, the value of the key is being uh, shown as 0, 1, 2, 3 on the third element. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. So in that scenario, uh, the total number of uh, buffer placeholders are 15, 1, 5. Is that right? Uh, yeah, it's actually uh, 16. We have 16 uh, elements in the array, I believe. It ends up, the end of the index is 15, but it starts at 0. So we have 16. And all the options are 4. I can try speaking a bit louder. The 16 index would be like next byte. Got it. Thank you. I should be able to generate uh, one of them. I'm not sure what I always do. Okay. Can we? Oh, yeah. It works. Oh, okay, I know what that is. So zero is actually like it's encoded as like two hexary, you know, uh, numbers only like not a, like a single one. So we're seeing three because that's the like second number of the zero. At which point, uh, you know, we have a, a value like directly there, but we have we're branching out. So I think if I created like another one. might be a bit tricky to actually create all the cases that we'd want. We might end up with the same sort of issue. Yeah, so here we're getting again, uh, like you remember how we were getting like a path and a value? That was because that was the only value left. Now we're again getting a hash pointing to the common path of like the, the next one. It's going to be a branch node again. We could, you know, again query, uh, find the path to that. Uh, 
But in this case, there's no value at that node. That's just pointing to child nodes. Yeah, well, there, there's a value, like if I query test key O2, there's going to be, again, a value here. But uh, yeah, I'm not actually sure why we're always at this index. I'd have to look at the the, the way this is encoded. I, I suspect it's like the, always the, the the latter part of the number two is what's used here instead of tree itself. Um, I can't recall exactly why that is, but uh, yeah, we in the normal like setting with like keys and stuff, we would expect like every basically level to to, to branch out, and and the fact that it's tree at the moment is just a peculiarity of the test case I, I've mm -hmm. come up with. Yeah. And lowercase, uppercase, yeah. Yeah, it's not lining up perfectly to, yeah, yeah exactly. So if we wanted to, to, like if we could natively like compute, you know, buffers and hexes, then it would be much easier to see what's going on. Now we're using like human readable keys. So, I mean, they're broken down to that, they're, you know, they're converted to hex. So at each, uh, each part of the way down that we go, it doesn't line up exactly with the end of the key. There's often like one next like character necessary to, to, to finalize the, the number zero, for example. Um, all right, so I'll go over. We have, we have three minutes. Oh, we have three um, minutes, actually. So I think maybe open up to just like general questions or um, comments or anything. Um, you know, we're, we're building this for you guys. So if there are things that are not working or confusing or that you'd like to see, we're very open to feedback and suggestions and help. Yeah, so like most of what we've done so far has been like working on, you know, just Merkle Patricia trees uh, themselves. Uh, a bit further down in that tutorial, like I encourage you to just keep going at home and ping me like on Discord or Telegram or Twitter if, mm -hmm anything like doesn't work as you'd expect. Uh, but there are like, we're working also like with blocks and with transactions and RLP encoding, uh, which is quite, I feel like it's how I learned about Ethereum initially, like through learning about these data structures. And the first draft of that tutorial was actually like me learning, you know, about this stuff and figuring out how, what's going on. And, um, and yeah. Um, and yeah, we're, we're an open source project. You can find us on GitHub. You can find us on Discord and chime in or ask questions. Um, yeah, we have a massive number of uh, external contributors who've helped, you know, over the years. The repo is uh, fairly old. I think it's like six years old or perhaps like even more than that. Sometimes I'll work on a part of the code and I'm seeing like the git blame like five, five years ago or something like that. <laughs> so it's really like a pretty old repo. We, we are extremely open to external contributors. Like sometimes we'll have people come up and just help out. And then we, we, you know, we include them in the, the team, like not in the formal like team itself, but we do like chat with them and are always happy to help people, you know, help the, the project we're working on. Uh, our future projects are, we're trying to improve the client syncing. At the moment, we only have full sync. It's super slow and, you know, you would never use that, you know, in production, obviously. Uh, uh, we're trying to do, you know, general like optimizations as well. So if anyone like is competent at that, we're really happy to like uh, get you started on that. We're improving like the JSON RPC endpoints. We don't yet serve all the RPC calls. So that's uh, it's an excellent place to start if you want to help out. Just implement a new RPC endpoint for us. Exactly. You can just go through the list of what we've implemented and just you know uh, come up you know, with easy ones that you want to implement. And it's a good way to get started learning about our repo. Uh, on my side, I'm working more on R&D for Virgil, Virgil trees and statelessness, which is, you know, sort of related to the Merkle tree stuff we've been uh, exploring. Uh, Scotty works on ultralight, uh, amongst other things. And uh, yeah, we're just improving the code base as well, making it uh, nicer with nicer types and uh, better performance. Any last uh, questions?
Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, I didn't think of adding that to the link tree. I will, uh, that link tree, linked above, I'll update it with a link to our uh, Discord so that then you can come in. It's the Ethereum JS Discord. Probably fairly easy to find as well, but I'll link it nevertheless. Yeah, I feel like one last question. I had a friend who actually worked with Ethereum JS and he was like telling me uh, about like, he also used that, um, is this actually interconnect is just for Ethereum DS or it can be like interoperable in other like I don't know uh, proof of proof of history like Solana or something like that I don't know if I'm just telling nonsense but he was telling me like he used that for uh, our RCP support uh, mm -hmm. kind of a thing how does it yeah. work because I, I was kind of confused and like he was actually using Ethereum DS for connecting with Solana yeah, so it's an uh, interesting question. So there's, there are, we've increasingly made the, our packages uh, configurable. So one of the things we've done in the past year is we allow you to uh, provide your own VM or EVM implementation. So you could have a chain that is not like strictly EVM or maybe that has like peculiarities or that are EVM-like but not like strictly the same. And you can just like parse that in when you instantiate, for example, uh, the client. You can provide your own like... Uh, whatever like rules you have for your blockchain there's obviously like a limit to that like there's a point where it's probably better just to build something else if it's like super different but it's still quite um, quite configurable so you could also like there are chains like Scylla I think which has like different rules for computing transaction hashes and stuff like that uh, I'm not like I haven't worked with that so I'm not sure how easy it would be to configure it but you can definitely uh, adjust some parts of the code and provide your own like hashing algorithm mm -hmm. and uh, use that instead same thing with like the Merkle Bridge trees thing we, we've been working with you could provide your own hashing algorithm it defaults to KKAC but I mean you can use whatever you want okay thank you yeah. other questions thanks right. for coming yeah thanks for coming